All right. When we talk about cognitive bias, we're referring to inherent errors um, in the way we think and the way we acquire and process information. And uh, the notion of cognitive bias is, is addressing the issue that commonly uh, things happen in the mental process that prevent us from accurately grasping reality even when confronted with the data that are needed to form a realistic view. So our, 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 our cognitive process gets kind of sidetracked and derailed. So I'm gonna have some exercises during this, this talk. And um, we won't take grades in here, but there is a rule. No joint ventures. <laughs> the, uh, the virtue of this comes from independently making an opinion and then we'll see you know, how we do it. Just out of curiosity, how many people do we have in here? Let's see how many tables. We have five tables of eight, 40, so we have a little bit, a little bit more than 40. Let's say 45 people. Okay, all right. What? Were you looking the other way? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, ready? Oh, okay. All right, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm not going to go into why it was that you saw an old woman or a young woman. That gets off into topics that I don't want to get into. <laughs> but <clears throat> that, that is, is an optical illusion, basically. And uh, it's one of the exercises that we're going to do. Here, here, here's another one for you. Which table is longest, the one on the left or the one on the right? Want to see them again? One on the left, one on the right. Isn't that amazing? It's an example of, of an illusion which continues even when you have the data to say, it's not the way you thought it was. So the two types of optical illusions, we've just looked at each, each style. The first one is a conceptual one. I, whether you saw an old woman or a young woman has nothing to do with right or wrong, it just is. It's something, some things that are, that are deep in the way you think about things or see things. The other type, is something that you can resolve, you can, you can measure, you can um, analyze. So I'll show you how cognitive bias relates to this as we go along here. Uh, we've already said it's a, it, there are inherent errors in, in the way we acquire and process information. They are analogous to optical illusions in the sense that the error remains compelling even if one is fully aware of reality. And they are intrinsic to human thought. So any system of acquiring knowledge to describe reality has to include or should include some mechanism to control for bias, reality check. Are you people in the business of systematically acquiring information? Repeated trials? Do you have a system that allows you to control for bias? Am I resonating? Please say yes. yes. Some of these biases may result from holding to your inherent preferences and philosophies regardless of contrary information. And just knowing about common biases don't, doesn't guarantee that you're free from them. So why is this important? Well, we depend on modern science to address and to assess the issues that affect the well-being of our society. So it's essential the scientific results be as objective, as free from bias as possible. Good science, good policy. Unfortunately, accumulating research is showing that cognitive bias is much more common in science and industry than previously realized and often not even examined for. But if we look at several different sectors, of professional en engagement endeavor, we find that, s that some professions deal with it successfully all the time. You know who is the most objective about 
uh, uh, assessing what, what the probabilities of events are? Weathermen. Why? Because they get constant feedback. They make forecasts, they look and see what happened. They make forecasts, they look and see what happened. The oil and gas business is analogous, although the time frame is different. The results they see are a year later, not the next day or so. The problem is how we translate that experience into science more broadly. For years, um, the general public had a very high opinion of science. In general, scientists were seen as maybe they were nerds, but they were objective, they were dependable. Um, and that reputation got translated into geoscience in the oil and gas industry. In the 40s and 50s, the oil and gas business was still highly, highly entrepreneurial, highly promotional, um, and with some of the baggage that goes with that. And when we began to introduce science into it, geoscience and engineering, it acquired some of the high reputation of science in general. So what are the tasks that face us as, as geoscientists in our business? <coughs> Finding opportunities, measuring them objectively, and, and, and generally the geosciences measure them with regard to two things. First of all, the estimated ultimate recovery translated into profitability. And then the second issue is how likely is it that production will be established. And then the third task is communicate objectively to our managers, to our clients, to our investors, so that they can have some confidence uh, in the objectivity of the recommendation. The problem is in our ENP geoscience, we generate these scientific and geotechnical data results, and they collide with uncertainty, commercial pressures, and self-interest. And those numbers get, in some way or another, commonly biased, and the result is underperforming under projects. Portfolios that underperform if it's systematic. Individual disappointments in projects in which uh, the results were more victimized than usual. We're all familiar with that. Here's an example. BP drilled 125 um, targets in the late 1980s and early 1990s. 125 targets. The red curve uh, shows the uh, what was predicted by the BP geoscientists. The green curve shows what actually was delivered, and these are for these are for discoveries only. So there's no chance in this. This is this is forecasting what the ultimate recovery would be for the project, given discovery. So over 125 global deep water targets, they delivered 45% of what BP was expecting. Here's another one from ARCO in the 1980s. They looked at 22 consecutive discoveries. The two black squares represent the envelope, the P10, P90 envelope of expectation. The red is the, uh, is the mean of that distribution. Uh, and the yellow represents what actually was found. Uh, you can understand that after 22 of those, ARCO says something wrong with the way we're evaluating projects. We'll come back and look at this slide later. So what are the common cognitive biases that we see in our world, our EMP world? Uh, the confirmation bias, that's the notion that somehow um, we tend to sort of discount or even ignore data that don't quite fit our hopeful expectations. Overconfidence. Uh, that's the one where our predictive ranges are too narrow and the, and the symptom of that, which we've found over the years, is when you go into a, a group of explorationists and you ask them, do you get a lot of surprises in your work? And they say, yes, your ranges are too narrow. You're behaving as if you know more than you do. 
uh, false analogs. We, we commonly use models or an analogous situations to use to, to predict, to understand a project. And it happens that sometimes we find that the actual analog that we used is not really a faithful analog uh, to build on. Uh, anchoring. Anchoring is the bias in which the first estimate you make has a way of biasing your final estimate. The, the original term for the, for the psychologist is anchoring and adjustment. What we do, we pick a number, then we sort of putting it, testing it against reality, against the facts that we see, and adjust and modify. And, and when that project process doesn't go through to completion, what we see is that the first estimate biases the final estimate. And of course, motivational bias, that's where perceived self-interest has a way of influencing the technical estimates. So what are the causes for that? And why does that happen? A lot of them. Uh, one is that people commonly come up with the answer sooner than they should. Uh, individuals who, who feel that their insights into the earth are better than yours are. I used to have a manager who said he could pass his hand over the structure map like a Ouija board. <laughs> uh, companies that don't have any consistent system for assessing projects. Uh, management or staff who don't have perspective, so they don't have a sense of what has happened in the past and what are the ranges of things that have transpired to judge against. Uh, people who don't have any imagination. If you don't have any imagination, you have a hard time visualizing what could happen within the realm of, of, of constraining facts. Uh, people who just don't do their work. People who just lazy. They just don't go through the final steps to get it as, a, as precise and objective as possible. Um, individuals whose personal self-interest is so pervasive that it, it inclines them to be generating numbers that are almost automatically canted in their favor. Uh, this, is, this is a common one where management um, does not allow enough time or budget to carry out a proper investigation of an opportunity. So as a result, you're looking at incomplete data. Uh, situations where management is not presented with a real objective, objective picture of risk versus reward. This is a big one. Companies that don't go back and look at what happened compared with what they said was going to happen. That's really painful. And you can't imagine the resistance that we get to that. It's, it's hard work and it's nobody likes to be measured. Uh, companies that reward activity versus results commonly have a lot of cognitive bias in them. But the biggest challenge we face is convincing educated technical and management professionals just like you that they are subject to cognitive bias just like everybody else. So we're going to do some exercises in here. Now, once again, we don't give grades in here, but I do need you to be objective. And remember, if you consult with the neighbor over here, that's like the blind leading the blind. <laughs> How many sheep are there? You want to see it again? Okay, now, let's talk a little bit about what I'm going to ask you to do. You're not going to have time to count all those sheep. I'm not going to give you that much time. So you're going to have to estimate, yes. okay? And um, well, let's let's show you a way of doing that. Instead of saying, "Okay, I'm going to guess that there's X number of sheep there," I'm going to ask you to estimate probabilistically. I want you to pick a low number such that you are 90 percent sure there's more sheep than that, and a high number we call a P10 number, is that there's only a 10% chance there could be more sheep than that. So we're going to ask you to estimate at 80% confidence. Now there's 
about 45 people in here, so if you estimated at 80% confidence, that would mean that something like around 35 or 36 people would have a range that included the correct answer, which I will give you later. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Now, just to be sure you understand this graph, there's a log scale. If this was the correct graph for those sheep, it is not. I mean, we're close. You would be saying, I'm 90% sure there's, there's more than seven sheep there. And you would be saying, I think there's only a 10% chance there could be more than 300 sheep there. That's what that's saying. Now, alert, again, this is not correct for those sheep. Ready? Don't forget that he's getting off over here. You want to be sure you include him. <laughs> okay. Now, low number, high number. Low number, you're ninety percent sure there's more than that. High number, you think there's a ten percent chance more than that. Okay. Now, if you wanted to know the exact number, the best guess, single guess. It would be either the median or the median of that, kind of halfway in, the, in between that number. But that, that's another issue. Don't worry about that. Let's just worry about the range right now. Okay? Oh, you're pretty good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, you, you're estimating at about 60%, maybe 70. Let, we're among friends. How many, how many did not have a range that included 175? Oh, you're better than I thought you were. Or maybe there's some of you that are embarrassed to hold your hands up. That's right. You're my friend. Okay. All right. Now it gets a little tougher. Same idea. Estimate as a range. 90% sure there's more than that. 10% sure it could be as many that could be more than that. 80% confidence interval. <laughs> P90 number, P10 number. Either write it down or commit it to memory. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you're in, if that number is in the range. If your number, if your range included seventeen eighty, you can hold your hand up. That's about ten. So let's see, ten out of forty-four is that eighty percent? No. That's about twenty-five percent. So we asked you to estimate at eighty percent confidence. You estimated as a group at 25% confidence. Now, we've given this ex exercise to literally thousands of people in the last 15 or 20 years. The results are always the same. <laughs> and, 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 and you're not bad people, it's just to, <laughs> you're, you're biased. And, and, and the thing that we want to emphasize is that this kind of bias is endemic in what we do. Okay. Now, we can test for this, like measuring the tables, we can test for this. We, we, we tested a minute ago when we said you actually were estimating as a group at about 25% confidence. We asked you to do 80%. So, okay. We showed you that. You're overconfident. Your ranges are too narrow. We can also test for conservative versus optimistic. How many had a range lower? The, the range, the total range was lower than 1780. Okay, thank you. Anybody have a range that was higher than 1780? Okay, so we're saying as a group, you were not only overconfident, but you were, you were conservative. And, and I, all I'm trying to get you to see is we can analyze this stuff if, if, we, if we will. Now, there's always some doubting Thomases who say, there are not 1780 pants there. <laughs> So just for you guys, I counted out 209. And I think if you look at that, you'll see that 1780 ain't a bad number. 
So let's apply this to our business. Characteristics of our EMP ventures are high uncertainty. Technology clarifies but doesn't eliminate it. We're always estimating. The prospecting process leads to being advocates. The fact that it's science, quote unquote, reinforces apparent confidence. And of course, we generate these projects one at a time, with the companies drilling them as a portfolio. So the company's acting like it's managing a casino, and we are operating like we are running one table. And of course, nobody like wants to bring bad news, you know, they cut off your head. <laughs> well, in the past, before we started doing this kind of stuff, our industry tried to address how we might reduce bias in our ENP ventures, because I'm not telling you anything new. We've known this for a long time. Uh, so we, we, uh, we, we asked the SEC to help us define what we meant by reserves and put some force of law behind that. That's why I brought the federal judge in here, Judge Hughes. He can <laughs> tell you about that. We certified engineers and then more, more recently geologists. Uh, companies brought in outside experts to bring a fresh pair of eyes to look at a project. Uh, some companies um, pitted engineers who were known to be conservative against geologists who were known to be optimistic. It wasn't fair to either group. Uh, some executives uh, used their own individual rules of thumb, which were commonly counterproductive. <laughs> um, and of course, within our community, we, we, we found out gradually who were the reliable, dependable operators and who were, who were not. Um, of course, the threat of lawsuits and public exposure had a certain impact, transitory usually. But the fundamental problem with this was that the underlying causes and remedies of the bias were not being addressed. <coughs> so, how do we do this today in our industry? And here are just seven techniques that we found to be very useful. Uh, what we call reality or plausibility checks. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Uh, trying to deliberately look at an opportunity and force ourselves, discipline ourselves to try to see multiple explanations for it as a way of widening our ranges. Uh, estimating probabilistic ra probabilistically rather than deterministically. Um, recognizing that many of these parameters fit the log normal distribution rather than a bell-shaped curve and fitting our predictive patterns to that led us to make better estimates. Trying to independently get uh, different views of a project so we can, we can again, widen our ranges. Uh, managing ENP as a portfolio of opportunities rather than a, than a series of single one-off ventures. And then having the courage to track our performance, having the courage to keep records, look at what we said was going to happen, and look and see what happened, and learn from it. So I'll go through some of these real quick, not all of them. Uh, start with a field size distribution, all the oil fields in the world. This is about uh, 30, 20 years old now, but it, uh, it's based on 30,000 oil fields around the world. <clears throat> and you can see the log normal shape of the distribution. That's a straight line on log probability paper. This is a probit scale here, and that's a log scale there. Uh, the P50 is 5.4 million. That is the, medi the median value. The P10 is 143. Uh, the P90 is 250,000. The P99, for all the oil fields in the world, is 18,000 barrels. Think about that for a minute. So when we look, for example, at a, uh, well, let me explain this. This is the prospect expected ultimate recovery in millions of barrels, 100 million, 10 million, 1 million. This is cumulative probability. It's a profit scale. Uh, if there was no uncertainty about the prospect at all, no uncertainty as to what the reserves would be given discovery, it would be a straight, a vertical line. Does everybody see that? No uncertainty, straight line. So the slope of the line is telling you something about how much uncertainty is involved with it. The greater the slope, the more uncertainty. Okay? So for example, in a characteristic development project, uh, 
expected recovery. Uh, you need to see a slope like this so where the, the, the P90 was uh, 40,000 barrels. It's a development well, 40,000 barrels. Uh, the uh, median was uh, 100,000. The uh, P10 was uh, 300,000 barrels. That sound about right for conventional development well, more or less? Okay. So notice the slope. What we see time after time among exploration projects is a presented distribution, predicted distribution for the discovery case that has a slope like that. So it says, well, the P10 for this is uh, 18 million barrels um, and the P90 is uh, 4 million barrels. So we say to the uh, exploration people, we see that your P99 for that predicted reserve distribution is 2 million barrels. Tell me, is there any chance in the world that that thing could end up as a crummy little one well field? And the answer almost always is, yeah, it could. So shouldn't we move this line back somewhere in here in which the slope would be more like that? That's a reality check. It's a good example of a reality check. Turns out the most common cause of project estimated ultimate recovery overestimates is not that the high side's too high, it's that the low side's too high. So the, the mean, the median, the number you're building your economics on is too high. Another example of a, of, of a, a a method to, to, to detect and reduce bias. Uh, the idea of multiple working hypotheses, the discipline to try to explain, come up with different scientific explanations for what you're seeing. What else could this be? And the way that manifests commonly is we ask the teams, that, what are the alternative scenarios? What else could this be? Make more than one map. Another technique that works is to ask people to estimate probabilistically, not the least of which is later on you can see how your forecast compared with the probabilities and detect how much bias you have and why. Uh, you, you all probably remember from children the, the, the story about the, uh, the six blind men from Hindustan who were asked to describe the elephant and the one on the back said, well, it's like a rope. The elephant's like a, 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 a giant snake or a curved spear, or a fan, or a tree, or a leather wall. Individually, they were wrong. Collectively, they had it about right. Now you also may remember that they fell to arguing vigorously among themselves as to which one of them was right, rather than trying to combine and meld those, those ideas. Does this stuff work? Good question. Uh, we have several different e examples of measurement, but this, this one I like particularly. Uh, th this came from Mobile in the 1990s. They were in the middle of changing from a kind of a, a prospect evaluation process that varied among different groups to a consistent one that was using these kinds of methods. And so uh, it happened that in one year they had 26 discoveries um, using the new guidelines that was this, this, this kind of system I'm talking about and uh, 28 that did not and if you look at the 26 that did what you see is that the outcomes were distributed relatively evenly through the probability the full 100% probability of outcome in other words <coughs> what it said was 12% of these discoveries ended up in the lower 20% and it turns out, happily for them, 32% um, ended up greater than anticipated. But overall, distributed roughly sub-equally sub through the whole range of probabilities. Compare that with the system in which the no, uh, uh, different systems were used, and you can see that 50% of the outcomes were smaller, substantially smaller than predicted. So you look at this kind of information, you can see, yeah. This stuff works. It's a lot of work, but it, it works. Save a lot of money. 
Okay, let's take this into the, into the realm of discussions of cognitive bias. The ultimate authority on this is Daniel Kahneman, wrote a terrific book called Thinking Fast and Slow, published about three or four years ago. How many of you have read that? Any of you? Worth reading. It's worth reading. He identified that we think in kind of two different systems. System one is what we'll call thinking fast, uses association and metaphor to, to produce a quick and dirty draft of reality. System two, slow thinking, thinks deliberately and rationally, arriving at reason and choices. The problem is that system two tires easily, often accepts the unreliable story about the world that system one feeds it. For those of you who are into philosophy, does this go back to Plato and Aristotle? Remember Aristotle was one that was always measuring things and classifying things and, and analyzing things. Plato was the guy who was always airy-fairy thinking about everything in the world. Optical illusions, two types. Conceptual, dimensional test. We can test how long the table was. We can't test whether you saw an old lady or a young lady. Cognitive bias. System one operates automatically, quickly, little or no effort. It's an intuitive process, impulsive, emotional. It's often unconscious. It's associated with fight or flight responses. It's the default option, thinking fast. System two uses control and conscious mental activity, invokes critical, deductive, and logical thinking, requires deliberate effort, thinking slow. Thinking fast is in the older part of our evolutionary brain, supports quick decisions that follow it, instincts and intuition. It receives incoming information before system two does. It's more prone to error in complex or uncertain situations, but how many decisions do we make in a given day? A hundred, a thousand? We don't have time to, to give long thought to every decision. Analysis by paralysis, or is that backward paralysis by whatever, you don't understand what I'm talking about. System two, thinking slow, it's in evolutionary terms, it's in a more recent part of our brain, it evolved to manage uncertain situations. Commonly doing this kind of work leaves you feeling uncomfortable when you have to make a decision in uncertain circumstances. Okay, so we have methods for coping with biases that are testable. System two, we can measure, we can analyze them, test them. But how do we deal with conceptual system one biases constructively? How do we deal with the bias of whether you saw an old lady or a young lady? Not that there's a wrong or right answer. It doesn't do any, anybody any good for me to tell you that your judgments and opinions are biased and mine aren't. <laughs> your parents probably told you many times, child, two things you don't want to talk about in public, religion and politics. I, is that resonating with anybody? Why? Because those things are system one type stuff. So what's the solution to deal with conflicts or differences of opinion in those kind of circumstances? First of all, maintain respect and communication. This goes back to Jonathan Haidt's book, The, the Righteous Mind. Anybody read that? Worth reading. I didn't think so at first, but it is. Um, focus on the process and the decisions that were made and then look and see what happened, that gives you then an opportunity to go back and resume the discussion. But there's more to this. Um, am I as biased as you are? She says yes. <laughs> uh, this goes back to some work by Emily Pronin, Objectivity in the Eye of the Beholder, Divergent Perceptions of Bias in Self versus Others how we see ourselves and how we see others. People see themselves differently from how they see others. They're immersed in their own sensations and emotions and cognitions. At the same time that their experience of others is dominated by what can only be observed externally. You can only see the expressions and listen to the words. And this basic asymmetry has broad consequence, leads to people to, people to judge themselves and their behaviors differently from how they judge others and those others' behaviors, and that can generate a lot of disagreement and conflict. And understanding what's going on, again, don't blame, understanding what's going on may help mitigate some of those. 
So let's do a little exercise here. I'm going to pose you three questions, three issues that are basically technical questions, but which have now come into the social sphere. You don't need to answer out loud, just do a little self-examination here for me. Genetically modified foods are too dangerous. You agree with that? Don't know? Disagree? Vaccinating kids is too dangerous. You agree with that? Don't know? Disagree? Man-made global climate change is too dangerous. Do you agree with that? Don't know? Disagree? If you think others' answers show bias, you think yours could too? And what are the sources of your information? Many and diverse, few and uniform. So why is this important? Most scientists recognize the existence and the operation of cognitive bias much more in other scientists than they do in themselves. But private sector scientists have ways and motivations to cope. The problem is that many public sector scientists recognize the existence of cognitive bias in scientific work theoretically, but very few practice active measures to control it in their own work. Now, value question. Is this because there's little or no penalty or timely reputational consequence for erroneous conclusions? Is this an, accounta is this an accountability issue? Richard Feynman, Nobel laureate, very prominent particle, uh, particle physicist, he said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. The, the, uh, the, the, the remedy for dealing with cognitive bias is dedicated practice of scientific method. He said, a kind of scientific integrity, a principle of scientific thought that corresponds to a kind of utter honesty, kind of leaning over backwards to try and prove your own theory wrong. Mark Twain said, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. <laughs> Western science version of that. Everybody talks about cognitive bias, but nobody does anything about it. But we do something about it in our field every day. So do weathermen and women. The problem is, how do you transfer those techniques and those values into the rest of science? Okay, I haven't said much about motivational bias, but here's just a few quick examples. Uh, Harry Warner says, that, who wants to hear actors talk? Do you think Harry Warner had any skin in the game of talking movies? He was committed to the silent movie era, you remember? Later on, Daryl Zanuck said, television won't last because people will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every day. <laughs> and here's my favorite from Thomas Edison, 1889. Fooling around with alternating currents just a waste of time. Nobody will use it ever. <laughs> now, Thomas Edison had a lot of skin in the game. He was trying to get the whole country to go to direct current. Remember that? And Tesla was going the other way, alternate current. All I'm trying to get at is, here are, here are knowledgeable people who are making essentially predictions or forecasts, but they're not free of their own self-interest. In our field, showing you science, this, it's, it's the selective use of data that overstate the expected value of a project in which the geoscientist perceives some personal benefit in getting the company to drill. In public sector science, it's selective use of data supporting findings that are more likely to attract funding or to promote favored socio-political philosophies. Both are conflicts of interest. Both are unprofessional. So we're seeing a lot more examples of papers being retracted. Anybody can go to a website called Retraction Watch? Y'all do it sometime. Be surprised how many papers are getting withdrawn these days. Uh, in our own field, USGS, uh, there was a, 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 a mass spec lab. Incidentally, for those of you who are wondering when I'm going to finish, I've got about uh, maybe max 10 more minutes and I'm through, probably a little before that. If you need to go, you're not going to hurt my feelings any. 
A uh, long history of questionable results from the USGS mass, mass spec lab in Denver. Uh, they had been reported twice of visits of the inspector general and uh, they continued to work. Uh, the most recent example where they've now been shut down is that they were working on 24 research projects that cost a total of $124 million. Those studies are now seen as unreliable. Uh, several of them were involved with analyzing surface water from an area of public land east of the Grand Canyon. It was government land, but it was not in the Grand Canyon. And the issue was whether, uh, uh, whether they wanted to adopt a 20-year moratorium on, uh, on surface mining activity or, or testing. And uh, the data were used to support the Department of Interior withdrawing this million acres. Uh, increasingly, you're hearing from knowledgeable people about the fact that scientific publications often their findings can't be reproduced. Uh, this is from Nature, the British equivalent of science. Of, uh, science. Uh, 47 of 53 published results of cancer research papers are irre irreproducible. Uh, Forbes reported 80 to 90 percent of claims from scientific studies in major journals failed to replicate uh, science. The U.S. AAAS publication. 39% of published psychological research could not be reproduced. Uh, this is the most recent one from Richard Horton, editor-in-chief of Lancet, which is the British medical journal. The case against science is straightforward. Much of the current scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Uh, this is a strong statement uh, given in about two and a half years ago from uh, Richard Smith, who was editor of the British medical journal founding member of the Committee on Publication Ethics. He said, research misconduct degrades trust in science should be a crime akin to fraud. After 30 years of observing how science deals with the problem, I've sadly come to the conclusion it should be a crime for three reasons. First, people have been given substantial grants to do honest research, so it really is no different from financial fraud or theft. Second, we have a whole criminal justice system that's in the business of gathering and weighing evidence, which universities are not very good at. And finally, science itself has failed to deal adequately with the research, with the research misconduct. That's stronger than I would, that, that, that remedy is stronger than I would advocate, but it, it's, it's emblematic of what, what we're coming to. Uh, the most recent example that we've seen is the uh, so-called pause buster having to do with global warming in which the report was delivered from NOAA just in time for the Paris uh, climate change. And, Turned out that afterwards, uh, John Bates, who was involved in the project, blew the whistle on it. Uh, turned out the report was rushed through in time for the UN Paris conference. Uh, the basic message was it claimed to debunk the 1998 to 2015 global temperature pause, and that there had been no, no warning. No one now concedes that the data were uh, flawed, being revised, and science, at least at the time, said they were considering retraction of the paper. I love this quote from Philip Handler, who was for 12 years president of the American Academy of Science. He said, scientists best serve public policy by living within the ethics of science, not those of politics. If the scientific community will not unfrock the charlatans, the public will not discern the difference. Science and the nation will suffer. Uh, I, I, th th this diagram, I think, is a, a real good example. Let me explain it. Uh, the spaghetti diagrams here, all these different colored lines, show the predicted global warming from 1975 to 2020 as about 45 different computer programs. The black line is the average of all those studies, and the dashed lines are one standard deviation of variation of, of, of uh, between these. The green bars, the green squares, are the measured surface temperature of the, of the Earth annually, average surface temperature. And the blue line is the measurements of the atmosphere from weather balloons and from, uh, from satellite studies. Now, without picking out anything in particular, any objective scientist can look at that and say, something is wrong with the climate models. You remember I showed you a similar diagram related to ARCO about 20 minutes ago in which they saw this was the envelope they had predicted and this is what they saw and after 22 results they said something's wrong. 
Okay, so it leads us to the, to the idea of, of, of the way the public looks at the objectivity of science, and it, it, it takes us to the question of, can you be an advocate in your scientific field and be objective? And I would argue that it suggests that it's perfectly okay for you to advocate for anything you want to. You know, it's a free society, we can petition the government. But you should not be advocating within your own field for pu pu public policy simply because it then takes away your objectivity. You see what I'm saying? Back to our science. We know uh, exploration is dominated by subjectivity and uncertainty. So it, we know it acquires, it invites the exercise of intuition, system one. And as a result, explorers tend to overvalue their prospects. So what are our responsibilities as petroleum geoscientists? First, it's the fun part, finding profitable oil and gas accumulations. Second part, measuring those opportunities consistently without bias. That's the business part. Think of it as a yin-yang diagram in which those two activities are, have to be constantly going on and held in a certain amount of tension. You have to expect, expect the fact that there's some tension across those boundaries. So the basic message that I'd like to leave with you is how to reduce cognitive bias in science, our science as well as the nation's science. How do we do that? Renewed commitment to the rigor of the scientific method. Remember Richard Feynman. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions, but uh, some of you probably have to go back to your jobs. So, so, yeah. so Peter, in the 30,000 oil fields, in the global oil fields, do you have some of the new big ones in there? Like I doubt it. I doubt it. I, because because those, data, those data went back to, I mean, the, the, that database stopped about 1990, probably, nine, something like that. But, it, it, so the message is, yeah, some of the big ones aren't in there, but a lot of the little ones aren't in there either. <laughs> you can see an optimist here. That's okay. That's okay. Well, you might be de dealing with two different populations. Yeah. Because yeah. that's traditional fields versus resource plays would be a separate population. Take that. Can I throw out another question? Yeah. You've given this a few times. Yeah, you know, I've given it. What kind of responses have you got? Uh, at the risk of sounding immodest, I have to tell you, uh, it's been well received every place I've been. <laughs> but I also have to say that, I, I do have to say that professional audiences seem to be a little more uh, <coughs> expressive than academic audiences. But I've, I've given it three or four different, gave it Colorado School of Mines, gave it University of Kansas. The University of Texas at Austin has not seen fit to ask me to give this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.